As the e-wallet war looms, one of the anointed TNG Digital has been going big on the charm offensive. But given Malaysians' complicated feelings about touch and go, does it have a bigger hill to climb? We talked to CEO Ignatius Ong about its strategy to be the chosen one and fighting guilt by association. So now that TNG Digital mm -hmm. has been chosen as actually one of the e-wallets for the government's huge e tunai Rakyat program, what kind of strategy are you going to adopt? Because TNG Digital has been very aggressive mm -hmm. in like going out, promoting. Yep. Do you have to tweak your promotions at all now that you, now that you are one of these wallets? Sure. I, I think the end game or the value proposition that we prefer to our users is that we want to make sure that they can spend it, well, the each night, the 30 ringgit that the mm. government's going to put into the wallet, they can spend it at all the kind of touch points that the typical population goes through. Right. So hence, uh, what we have done, and this was not in the plan of E29 anyway, and we started this as far as early last year, mm. was, the, was that we onboarded quite a lot of merchants. So as of today, still growing, we have about 120,000 touch points, mm. merchant touch points. So it encompasses groceries like Tesco's, Giant, the Because Mighty's. profile's important too, right? There's yep. no point giving hundreds of touch points to stores that probably you don't touch as much. Exactly. So it's got to be the typical Malaysian touch point. So we have also started to onboard a lot of SMEs as we speak. Mm. So these are the places like, for example, Pasar Malam, Wet Market. We're talking about the coffee shop around the corner where you have your chicken rice, mm. your mamak, and mm. your roti chana and all that. So mm. these are the places that we feel that addresses the grassroots of Malaysians. Who's getting the 30 ringgit anyway? The biggest issue I think people have with adoption, especially for TND Digital, mm -hmm. is this guilt by association. Mm -hmm. And people have, let's say, very complicated feelings mm -hmm. towards the touch and go card. Okay. It's, it's very complicated. You can even say that sometimes it's resentful. So I know that when people look at options for e-wallets, mm -hmm. they can be a bit resentful. Okay. So how do you get over this guilt by association? I think, um, I'm going to use the word resentful. What I do actually see it as a plus point for us. See, Touch and Go name is actually a household name and it's been in the Malaysian public for the last 20 years. Yes, but it can be a bad household name too. Well, I wouldn't even say that as well. You okay. th think about it, it has actually brought Malaysia into a cashless state 20 years ago mm. when the card came into play. All right. And I think this is just more of an extension to say, look, as time rolls, today is the e-wallet era, and we want to see how the transition from the card into the e-wallet space comes through. And over and above it, that's why we want to say that from an e-wallet perspective, we need to be able to propose a huge value to people. And that's where we're saying we are at merchants area, we are online, offline, we can do bills payment, and we can also facilitate for you purchasing, let's say for example, mm. a simple meal at let's say the mixed rice store. So those are the things that we believe has a strong value proposition to the user. The feelings I think that Malaysians have mm. for, for Touch and Go in general have to do with the fact that uh, many view it as a monopoly. Mm -hmm. So. I always say that you can have the best product in the world, but mm. because it's a monopoly, right. you're automatically resentful. Okay. That, 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 is, that is, I mean, it's just human nature. It, yep. it, you could cure cancer tomorrow <laughs> and people would still be resentful. Right. So how, even with your value proposition, you're pushing out your campaigns and all of this, will it be enough to kind of win minds? Yep. Well, you know, as opposed to maybe the other two who don't have as much complicated history. I, I believe we have a very strong value proposition and I always believe that when we speak to a user or s let's say for example someone who has a certain kind of negative comments with regards to us, yeah. we always try to address their pain points. Why? What are the issues that is really, really basically affecting your decisions to let's say use touch and go? And I always believe that we have a very good answer for every pain point that they have. So ultimately it's not about a brand association with something else is about what we can do for our user. The other issue is back-end. I think that's mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, the user experience when it comes to wallet, when it comes to topping up and everything like yep. that. And you mentioned at the beginning of this interview that about tolls, you know, that's mm -hmm. why people know the touch and go name. Yep. There is so much confusion mm -hmm. over RFID, wallet and the card. Okay. That That's probably another reason why if you look at you know, a lot of the customer complaints, mm -hmm. that still needs to be addressed. Why is the system 
especially when it comes to like wallet card and things, still perceived as so clunky. My parent company, Touch and Go, has about 25 million cards in circulation yes. today, of which is held by about 12 million unique users in Malaysia. So think about it, one user would probably hold about two cards at this yep. point in time. And we realised that going into RFID tomorrow is not something that is going to happen straightforward. But ultimately, at the end game, will you be able to upload from both ends and still just have one pile of cash to, to draw from? That means like, if you top up your card, if you top up your wallet, that amount just sits there and it can be drawn either way. The, the ultimate goal is to move everyone into RFID and it takes a while. So the pay direct again comes into play to make sure that every Malaysian who has procrastinated to go and do the RFID now gets to enjoy the e-wallet benefits because mm. the topping up would be a lot seamless now. You don't need to go and physically drive your car to let's say Petronas and all that. But at the, the end game is also about moving all of these guys into RFID. And that's also the, the, the vision of the government. What do you look like at 2020 in terms of your merchant numbers? We mentioned quite a lot about the fact that it's mm. grassroots, it's everywhere that you go, you know, things that you touch every single day, places you go every single yeah. day. And now you have quite a big number, mm -hmm. but how much are you intending to grow this okay. year? Okay, we have at this point in time, still growing as we speak, it's about 120,000 mm. touch points. Uh, we have onboarded at least a good 60% of the key accounts. And when I talk about key accounts, these are the really, really big names like mm. KFCs, like the 7-Eleven, like the Tesco's, right? Yeah, part of your everyday life. Correct. 90% of the transaction a Malaysian made, a typical Malaysian made, is actually still in cash. And those are the places that we want to get in there. Because our mission is actually to convert cash utilization. That is the key part of it. We are at the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. If I were to meet you, Ignatius, at mm -hmm. the end of 2020, what would you have hoped to achieve? Goals and KPIs for the year? Well, I would have hoped, and I believe with the team that I have today, we should be actually having half of the Malaysian population in our pocket. And we will have probably 80% of all the key accounts merchants that we've talked about. Ambitious. Very ambitious, but we're already at 60, so it's another 20% for the key accounts. The SMEs, we want to be at all secondary, primary and secondary cities already by then.